Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night service here at Charlestown Missionary Baptist Church. Let's stand together. We're going to open with a song. Page number 75, 75. you be free from the burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood would you or evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there's power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working Power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power. Wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Let's open in prayer. Brother Jim Kitts, would you open us in prayer, sir? Amen. All right, let's sing again. Page 148. 148. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme in the earth or main. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal strain. Tis the grandest theme. Tell the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. 
is the grandest theme Let the tidings roll to the guilty heart To the sinful soul Look to God in faith He will make thee whole Our God is able to deliver thee He is able to deliver thee He is able to deliver thee Though my sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Oh, we'll just take a moment to make a few announcements, and then we'll look at the prayer list uh, together. Uh, course, don't forget tonight uh, we will be having our business meeting directly following the service. Uh, next Wednesday night uh, is ministries night and we'll be having the ladies and men's Bible study groups meeting, uh, Awana and also the youth group. Uh, July 28th is the gospel singing night at the county fair and then uh, the final Sunday of this month the 31st is youth Sunday and then uh, August 5th, uh, just a few weeks away, is a teachers and leaders meeting in the Fellowship Hall. Dinner starts at 6 o'clock, and uh, the Gilberts are hosting that meal. And if you're able to help with that, uh, please talk uh, with Miss Debbie about that. And, of course, uh, leading into our prayer list, of course, pray for Pastor. Uh, he did uh, spend quite a bit of time last night into the morning uh, in the hospital, um, uh, somehow he managed to knock a ladder uh, onto his head and uh, that but the injury was more about his neck I think and so uh, they did a check on him and it seems like everything so far was just that he hurt and it was more uh, muscle than it was any uh, bone or in injury like that so but he is very uh, tired from the, the medicine that they gave him to try to help him uh, get some relief and relax the, the muscles. So be in prayer for him. And, uh, of course, uh, we want to, uh, if you can, encourage him, let him know you're thinking about him and Miss Debbie, and I know they'll appreciate that. Uh, also, uh, continue to pray for these uh, on our prayer list. Uh, we're continuing to pray for uh, those grieving over recent losses. Uh, pray for the William Brenneman family. Uh, also, these dealing with uh, sickness and injury. Uh, continue to pray for those uh, with cancer. Donnie Reed, uh, Donnie McMillan, Pearl Horn, Hayden Weslow, uh, the ladies from the pantry that were mentioned, Bob Burns, uh, Kimberly Pettit, Ed Hackett, uh, dealing with lung cancer, Craig Henry, uh, dealing with uh, lymphoma, uh, Patricia Music. This was a request given to us uh, online. Uh, she's dealing with cancer. Uh, Danny Paisley, uh, Donna Andrews, Jeannie Sizemore, Arthur McMillan, uh, Kevin Hollenbaugh, Eric Klotz, Rita Shineman, Joshua Watson, uh, his mother. Uh, this is another online request. She's dealing with cancer. Uh, Carl Stanley, dealing with colon cancer. Uh, Bob Lance. And Norm Meadows uh, is dealing with bladder cancer. Pray for those. Uh, continue to pray for these under heart-related issues. Joanne Gilly, Mickey Gilbert, and Paul Mullins. Uh, also, these uh, specific needs, uh, pray for Brother Jim, uh, again, with his shoulder. Uh, continue to pray for Mark Thompson and Ralph Miller. They're both still recovering from a fall. Uh, James Kenner, Alva Salas, uh, Joyce Murphy, uh, and again, uh, also continue to pray. For, I don't. Has anybody gotten an update on Brother L? I I had not. Yes, Adam. Uh, I called him yesterday. He's still um, going pretty good. Okay. He's just very tired. Sure. Okay. Okay. So let's continue to pray for him. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the, what we had just, the, per Elva, who with the, the retinas, again, her left eye, it seems she's lost pretty much every, all of her vision, but they're trying to correct what's still there and also on her right eye. So pray for, continue to pray for her and, and also Brother L, who's just still very 
week, uh, but continuing to recover. Uh, continue to also pray for uh, Angie dealing with the wisdom tooth, uh, Callie Harmon starting physical therapy, uh, Sherry McGill's uncle Wilbur, uh, who also had a bad fall, uh, pray for him. Uh, Tiffany Smith, uh, Jerry Stapleton needs a, a liver transplant, pray for him. Uh, Brad Hutchinson, uh, Crystal Jensen, uh, Marie Maldoon, uh, again, this is, she's still on bed rest, having, uh, she's expecting those twins. Uh, continue to pray for my uncle, uh, Billy Martin, who's uh, still recovering uh, from his liver transplant. Uh, Taylor Jensen, dealing with a kidney stone. Uh, Mike Sewell, uh, dealing with back issues. And Millie Curtis, uh, with a, uh, her back is broken. Pray for those. Uh, pray for uh, these under general health issues. Uh, Deborah Mullins. Uh, Joanne Fitzgerald, Faye Rourke, uh, Letty and Joe Carpenter, Tammy Langford, uh, Randy Mullins, Kathy Gilbert, Kit Rhea, Patty Duval, Nancy Estes, uh, Darlene Ruza, Sue Cadle, Cookie Karshner, uh, Bonnie Glick, Virginia Scaife, uh, Bernard Dickens, uh, Stan and Reba, uh, T.D. Burgess, Rachel Vance, and Linda Sewell Holder. Uh, under spiritual needs, uh, continue to pray for these. Uh, Joan Patrick, her daughter Leslie. Uh, pray for J.D. and Courtney Allen, the Matthews family, Joshua Blake, uh, the young men from development, uh, Harvey Wall's grandson, Buddy Howell, uh, Amy Spencer, pray for her family and her daughter. Uh, Helen Bishop, pray for her children and grandchildren. Jimmy Sawyers, Caitlin Mayberry, uh, our missionary families, pray for them. Uh, April Rock, and her family, Andy Harmon, uh, Brother L's granddaughters, uh, the Simpkins, pray for their children, and also the McGills, praying for their children, uh, Billy's Baker's family, uh, and Amber especially, uh, Joe Gonzalez's family, Elizabeth Heisler, and also pray for Daniel's cousin who's dealing with uh, marriage issues. Uh, also, uh, for these to be saved, our family and friends, uh, Ray Justice, Billy Harmon, L's son-in-law, Joel, uh, Chris Murphy, uh, Joshua and Aaron Rea, and Frank Dieter. Uh, also, these other requests uh, continue to pray for our essential workers and first responders, uh, family and friends serving in the military. Pray for uh, those who are deployed, Zach and Bryson and Brendan Smith. Uh, pray also for uh, uh, David Gilbert's estate uh, to be settled. Pray for uh, the camp meeting uh, services. We, had, uh, we were able to go. I know a few folks from the church were there last night. It was a great service. And the Lord uh, really uh, blessed through the preaching and the singing. It was a great time. I know they're still going through the end of the week. If you're able to, I would encourage you to try to go out. and know it will be a blessing to you. <clears throat> also continue to pray for our nation. Uh, pray for our daycare kids and workers. Uh, is there any unspoken requests tonight? By the raise hand. All right. Let's, yes. Yes, and yeah. so yes, and that is a praise, again, that uh, with uh, Pastor's uh, accident that it wasn't worse, uh, and we're certainly thankful uh, for that. Uh, also, uh, continue to pray for our, our nursing home ministry, and also pray for these who are traveling. Uh, I know the Harmons are away, and also the Overbays are away. Can, uh, pray for those. Uh, and then also, again, also these other praises, you know, um, uh, Rachel Vance, also that was mentioned, uh, I think Lois had mentioned it, uh, that there was a church in Virginia that she had mentioned they had voted uh, on a new pastor and he is going to come on and they praise the Lord for that. Uh, is there any other requests that we need? Yes, Brother Jim. Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord that Brother Jim's shoulder is doing much better. The list of things to do, I'm sure, is quite long. So <laughs> it's time to get to work. <laughs> yeah. Jessica Stauffer. He just found out her cancer is terminal. Okay. All right. So let's pray for her, Jessica Stauffer. All right. Any others? Yeah, Andrew. Treslo? Treslo. Oh, okay.
All right, any others? Adam. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're. It came through Perryville pretty hard, and uh, there was a lot of stuff laying around after it was over, but we're thankful everything was okay at our place, too. We do praise the Lord for that. I know there are a lot of people. A couple of churches that I know in over in Hartford County that aren't having service tonight because there's no power in Churchville, or there's no power in a lot of Bel Air still. So, uh, but we praise the Lord uh, for His protection over many here. We're thankful for that. All right. Any others want to? All right. Well, if we will, let's everyone who can and is able to come. We'll gather around the altar. We'll pray over these. And let's go to the Lord. Amen? It's wonderful that we have the opportunity to come to the throne of grace at any time. Let's pray together. And I'll ask Brother Rick Gilly, would you lead us in prayer tonight, sir? Has anyone come to sing tonight? Ruby, are you coming to play? All right. Are you just playing? Okay. All right. Why don't you come then?
Was there anyone else? I'm glad Ruby was ready. Or it would have been just me tonight. All right. All right. Thank you, Ruby. I appreciate that. Thank you for doing that for us. Let's take our Bibles this evening and we'll turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12. The Gospel of Mark to the 12th chapter. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to preach tonight and to which one is it on it's on maybe it isn't oh it was on mute it was on but it was on mute no problem Gospel of Mark, the 12th chapter, and Jesus is already, again, uh, if you are where we are, of course, Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, the, the Gospel of Mark is, is an interesting book as uh, compared to the four Gospels because it is the shortest of the Gospels, but uh, that also gives evidence or gives a kind of a clue as to what it is in terms of the style of writing it's a it's a book of action uh, it gets really right into the the works and the words of Jesus and it doesn't really uh, give a whole uh, a lot of other uh, details like the other gospels do uh, but in Mark chapter number 11 of course Jesus has made his entry into Jerusalem prior to his uh, time where he will be tried and he will be uh, crucified. Uh, and of course, again, uh, in leading up to the time where Jesus is going to be uh, betrayed and where he is going to be put on trial, his authority is questioned by the spiritual and religious leaders of the day. And they, uh, of course, wanted to find out and they said, what authority do you have? To do these things or who gave you this authority that's how they that's how chapter 11 really ends and concludes is uh, Jesus saying well he, he asks they ask him a question and uh, then he asks them a question he says well I'm not going to tell you because you can't answer my question I'm not going to tell you uh, by what authority I do these things but then he begins to go into a parable in chapter number 12 and notice what it says in verse number one it says, and he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set an hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And at the season, he sent to the husbandmen a servant that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent unto them another servant, and at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again, he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir, come... Let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen, and will give the vineyard unto others. And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. And they left him and went their way. And I want you to notice with me, of course, and, and we're going to continue reading uh, further into the chapter, but let's, let's just get 
uh, the picture of what Jesus is trying to say here. Remember, they had already questioned, they said, by what authority do you have to speak and to teach and to do these things that we've heard that you've been doing all throughout uh, the, 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 the nation of Israel? And, and what authority do you have to do this? Who has given you that authority? Well, in chapter 12, he, he does, in fact, uh, by way of a parable, in, if you think about it, he gives an answer to the question. And what he does is he describes and says that a certain man planted a vineyard. And then he describes all the things that he did. And, and notice how it's described. It's, he set a hedge about it, digged a place for the wine fat, built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. If, uh, first off, let's consider verse 1, and notice that Jesus here is using this imagery to describe God and the nation of Israel. And how... Here is this man who, uh, of course, if you imagine here for a moment, this is God who planted this vineyard. He made everything uh, about it that was good for, for having and to be profitable to do things with. And it was all prepared by him and yet given, notice, says, to a husbandman, let out. It's the description of how God, who delivered his people out of bondage in Egypt, and brought them where? Into the promised land. Now, of course, if you remember, when the promised land is described uh, throughout the, the journey of the nation of Israel as Moses, who led them first and led them all the way uh, for uh, over 40 years through the wilderness because of unbelief. But remember, when Moses sent the spies in to give a report on the land. They described it as what? A land flowing with milk and honey. A land that they brought these, these giant uh, 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 grapes and, and had brought all these things and said, it, it's, it's a land that we can be very prosperous in. And if you think about it, he brings them into this land and it's a, a land even today. If you consider the, uh, the geography of the Middle East, the nation of Israel in that particular area is, 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 is completely different compared to the regions surrounding it, right? The Middle East, of course, is, is, is prosperous because of what? Because of oil. But it's oil in the desert, right? But the nation of Israel is a very, what? It, it, it has a, a thriving agriculture, it's a, different, it's a different climate. It's, it's a, along the Mediterranean. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, country. And yet, it's all there and given to the nation of Israel. It's all there prepared for them. They didn't do anything, right? It was already made ready for them. And God gives it to them. And notice, it, then he continues on, though, because in verse 2 uh, through verse number 5, it says, at times he would send servants. What? Because remember, God gave the nation of Israel the promised land. He, he said, I will be your God, you will be my people. But there were conditions to what God had given to them, right? But what happened? Did they obey the command and the covenant of the Lord? Did they keep their end of the bargain? No, they didn't. Often we see throughout the Old Testament and through uh, the passages on the nation of Israel, they did what? They left the God of their fathers and went to serve Baal or went to serve whoever uh, was, was popular at the time. And yet throughout that time period, God would do what? He would send prophets, wouldn't he? He would send men to remind the people of Israel of who they were and what God had promised and what God had commanded them to do. But what would they do? They would reject them. Notice here it says, verse uh, 2, it says that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. God was saying, hey, I'm ready to receive uh, an accounting for what I've given to you. Remember, not only were the people of Israel supposed to worship him, but they were to do what? They were to give of the, the fruit of the land. They were to give not only of the fruit of the land, but of their time and all those things that God had commanded them to do. But notice it says in verse 3, it says, They caught him, they beat him, and sent him away empty. Verse 4, it says, Send another. They cast stones, wounded him in the head. Verse 5, it says, They killed many others, beating some and killing some. Hey, Think of the, some of these prophets and what happened to them. 
But then notice verse 6. It says, Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved. It's interesting when you think about it like that, right? Think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his what? Only begotten son. Here it says, Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Now, it's interesting because this parable here now is, is stepping a little bit into what? Into prophecy. But if I could go back and think about what uh, the, the Bible says in John chapter number 1, where it says what? He came unto his own, and what? His own received him not. Here, now, Jesus is saying, God sent his son to the nation of Israel, right? The, the people of Israel were given all of these great blessings, but the greatest blessing they would have received was what? They were to be the ones who would bring Messiah into the world. He would be one of them. And yet, when he came unto his own, his own received him not. But then notice, it says, they took him, they killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. When Jesus was crucified, who had to bury him? His own followers. In a borrowed tomb. Right? Verse 9 says, What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen, and will give the vineyard unto others. Think about this. In, this. in this time right now, who has the light of the gospel been given to? It's been given to the church. We're here today preaching the message of Jesus Christ. The Jews were scattered. Now they've come back to the land... And we know, of course, if you've been uh, with us in Sunday school, there's a lot in Revelation to talk about that, and that's for, another day, uh, that's for another time. But notice here in verse 10, it says, And have ye not read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Isn't that amazing? Jesus Christ became that cornerstone. What is our salvation founded upon? Jesus Christ. What is the church... The church is one foundation. It's built on Jesus Christ. Even though his own people rejected him, he has become that chief cornerstone. But notice in verse 12, it says, And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people. For they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. So their tactic was at first, they, they wanted to just arrest him right there on the spot. But again, why is it, notice it says they, he, they feared the people, why? Because he pointed out to them their hypocrisy. Even though they were the religious leaders, I mean, it's not very different from today, is it? Uh, we may have leaders, but they're not very popular, right? It's amazing, people say, well, how do they keep getting voted in? I don't know either, right? But... Notice it says they left him, they went their way. So now, verse 13, they're going to try a different tactic. Notice what it says. It says, And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. Now, uh, notice here, there's two different groups, but they were working together for a common goal. First off, their common goal right now was to try to discredit and to uh, destroy this one who had come in Jesus. But notice they, the, two the two groups represent two different kinds of, of, of philosophies and, and, and goals. Of course, first off, you have the Pharisees. They are the religious leaders, right? They are the ones who are directing uh, the spiritual pulse of the nation, if you will, of the people. 
They're the ones who set all those customs and all those traditions. They're the ones who were supposed to be the keepers of the law and the ones who were supposed to uh, uh, maintain that, uh, that order going all the way back to Moses and all the way back even further to Abraham. And then there's the Herodians. Now the Herodians were interesting because, you know, if you think about some of the Pharisees, and if you, if you know a little bit about the history of the time, of course, the nation of Israel was scattered, going back to the Old Testament. Now they've come back, but the land does not belong to them, does it? God gave it to them and said, it will be yours, but if you don't obey my word and if you break my covenant, it's going to be given to someone else. So who did it belong to at this time? The Romans. The Romans were the authority. They had the seat of power. They had the, the military to maintain an order over the people. So if you know, of course, most of the Pharisees were willing to stay in line with that. Some of them, though, were like, you know, remember what Peter said, right? Peter said, is it time that you're, you've come back? Right? Remember he said to Jesus, you've come to take back the kingdom, right? It's, it's going to be ours again. Peter was, a, was what we would call today in, in terms, we'd call it a nationalist, right? He wanted the nation of Israel to be once again what it was going back to the Old Testament, like in the days of David and Solomon. And there were some Pharisees, but the Herodians, they were leaders who, as the name would suggest, they were those who were fond of the Roman leader who was in the seat of power within the nation of Israel, and that was Herod. And they, were, uh, they believed in the Roman government, and they supported it, at least publicly, they supported it. And so now these two groups have come together, and they said to catch him in his words. But notice in verse 14, it says, And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Always be careful when someone tries to flatter you, right? Right? They're trying to flatter him, but they, but they are, they are say, even in their flattery, they are speaking the truth, right? The Bible says God is not a respecter of persons. Your background, your, your upbringing, your, uh, your family heritage will get you no closer to heaven than the poorest person laying in the gutter on the street, doesn't matter what your education is. Doesn't matter uh, who your father was or who your grandfather was. You know, when people, people get together, what, what's, what's something we do in small talk? We say, well, hey, did you know I was related to this person? That might be impressive to some, but it's not impressive to God. But here they say, you, you regard us not the person of man. You teach the way of God in truth. So now they're going to ask him a question. They, they're trying to put him on the spot. They say, you always tell the truth and you tell it like it is. So here's the question. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Always one of everybody's favorite topics, right? Paying taxes, paying the government. Questions of, uh, f of government rule or what type of government. Uh, are, are you a communist? Are you, a, are, are, are you a, someone that believes in democracy? Or you believe in free trade and free enterprise and all these things? They're, they're trying to ask him, hey, is it lawful? Is it, is it right to give tribute to Caesar or not? Verse 15 says, shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them. Now, of course, what was their hypocrisy? First off, they were just trying to get him to say something that would, if anything, embarrass him. But what were they really trying to do? They were trying to make him look bad in front of the people so that they could justify arresting him. And so... He, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. 
and they brought it. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now, of course, here's the, here was the problem. If Jesus had answered yes, right? So if he had said yes, it, it's lawful to give the tribute to Caesar. Now remember, of course, uh, the question, and, and, and it's not just a, a matter of tax here, right? It's not just a matter of taxes. I know that in, in America, supposedly, we give our taxes because we freely decided that we should give taxes for the benefit of the, of the state, the community, the nation, right? We, we willingly pay of our own free accord, right? But here, the tribute was what? A conquered nation's tax. Were they paying for tr protection? Sure. Were they paying for uh, basic uh, public services? Sure. But they were also paying for the fact that they said, don't forget that we are in control. That we are the ones who conquered you. And of course, you know, the Romans, they, they had conquered the Greeks who had previously controlled, who had taken control from the Persians, who had taken control from the Babylonians. If you think about, you know, remember Daniel's uh, uh, and uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the statue of the four, uh, the four different types uh, of materials that statue was built. Of course, we know is the Babylonians controlled uh, the nation of Israel for a time. Then the Persians came in. Uh, that was even during the time of, of Daniel. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the Greeks had it for a time. And then the Romans now were in control. And so they said this tribute. If he had said, yes, it's lawful, do you think the people would have been happy with him? No. Why? Because every time they paid that, they had to be reminded that they were living in a conquered land. If he had said no, then what? The Pharisees and the Herodians could have simply said, see, this guy is a troublemaker. We've got to arrest him. I, I know this word is... this word." could really get me in trouble today, but, you know, he said, he might want to lead an insurrection. But that's what they could have said. They could have justified that and said, this guy is against the government and against the authorities. And so Jesus here, of course, he knew their hypocrisy. And so he said, listen, bring me a penny. Now, of course, the image we see, we see here, very simply described, the image born on that coin was the image of Caesar. And if you read about it and study about it a little bit, notice Jesus said the superscription. Of course, today, now, see, I always have to be careful when I do this because you never know. It's embarrassing if I walked up here and there was actually nothing in here. Uh, but no, I always make sure. Um, but today, you know, in the United States, of course, I don't know how much this applies, but it is still on there, right? What's on the back? I know it's too small for you to read, but I'm assuming you know what it says back here. What does it say? In God we trust. Now, of course, on the front, it's a picture of George Washington. It says the United States of America, but it doesn't... If you took a, a note from another country a lot of countries, what would it say on it? It would have a picture of someone who was what? Royalty. Something that would say, this person's in charge. This person is our, our king, our, our queen. And, and it would even, some even state that they not only have royal authority, but they have what? Divine authority. Well, that's what that coin would have said. It wouldn't have just said a picture of Caesar. It would have said, this is in essence, our God. This is our ruler, our divine ruler. He cannot, create, he cannot make a mistake. He cannot uh, have a flaw. And so when Jesus said, whose is this image and superscription, they said unto him, it's Caesar's. And then, of course, we know the answer to this question. It's, it's a pretty well-known uh, verse. In fact, I would say even amongst 
uh, non-believing people, those who have a, a, a nominal understanding of Scripture, it's probably one of the more well-known because it does deal with something that a lot of people understand in talking about government. And tonight, though, for a few minutes, I don't want that first phrase to be the focus. Because rather than looking at render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, I'm not here to tell you tonight whether or not you should pay your taxes. That's up to you. And if you want to go that route, God bless you. I don't, I don't know what to tell you other than uh, we try our very best to pay ours. And uh, if you don't want to do that, uh, well, have fun. Uh, but notice the second phrase. Because the first phrase, it, that question was not the important question to Jesus, was it? Because he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. It was very simple. Even what I showed you a moment ago. That currency was printed in the United States of America. In essence, it belongs to the United States of America. It's been given to me. But it's been given as a statement of the ability to pay for something. But here, Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. He said, he made that. It belongs to him. But the more interesting statement that Jesus made was what? And render to God the things that are God's. And if you think about that for a moment, I want you to turn with me. Because let's consider some things that belong to God tonight. If you would, turn with me back to the book of Genesis. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. In Genesis. And we'll go back to the second chapter. Or excuse me, the first chapter. Let's go back there first. And I want you to keep that, that thought in your mind for a moment. What did Jesus say? When they gave him the, the penny, the question that he asked was, what? Whose image? is this. What image is born on this coin, this penny? Well, notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 26. The Bible says, and God said, let us make man, and what's the next phrase? In our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Isn't it amazing to think about this? God made you in his image. You see, again, he took that coin. He said, whose image is this? Whose does this belong to? They said, well, it's Caesar's. He said, then give it back to him. But when you think about what the Bible says here, if you would, turn with me just over the page, Genesis chapter number 2, and notice what the Bible says in verse 7. It says, the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. The life that you have been given, the soul that you have that's eternal that will never die, the, the life that you enjoy today was given to you by God, but more important than that, the image that you bear is the image of God. It belongs to him. When you think about who you are, what makes you? Not just a, a body, but a soul and a spirit. What makes up your, uh, your intellect, your personality, the talents that you have? So much of, of who we are. You know, I, I think about uh, when we see... People come and, and, and whether they play or, or they sing and they use their talents, they use their abilities, what? Not just to entertain, but to minister and to give praise and honor and glory to God. But what are they doing? They're giving back to God what is rightfully His. 
When we think about the, the questions of life today. And again, when people say whether it's wrong or, or whether it's right or if it's pro this or pro that or am I pro choice or am I pro life, well, listen, the fact is this. David said that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. David said that we're uh, conceived, uh, we were conceived in our mother's womb and that life begins at conception. But more importantly than that, that life that begins, at the moment that life begins, it's an image bearer of an almighty God. It belongs to him. There's more to consider than just convenience, is there? There's more to consider than just, is it something that uh, is, a, is a temporary uh, uh, putting things at ease or just to, to get me out of this situation? Every life bears the image of God. It belongs to Him. Your talents, your treasure belongs to Him. Not just, uh, we're not talking about money. I'm talking about the talents that you have, the, the, the life that you have, the, the strength and physical well-being that you have, and whether you have much or you have little, it still belongs to God. He gave it to you. We ought to render back to God the things that are God's. The question that I want to ask you tonight, the question I want to challenge us all with is this. It's not a, it's not a matter of whether or not we can pay to keep ourselves under the law. The question is this, can we give back to God the things that belong to him? You think not just about your family, or, or your, your, your personal life, but your family. When the Bible says that children are a heritage of the Lord, it's our children have been given to us by God. I think about Hannah. And if you would, turn with me there. Let's go to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, and we'll go to the first chapter. 1 Samuel, chapter number 1. And of course, we know a little bit of the story, but let's, let's read in verse number 5. It says, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her for, to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And so he did, so, and as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man child, then I will give, unto him, uh, give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Let's go down to verse 19. It says, And they rose up, early, or they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to the house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel. 
saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. It's amazing, though, to think about this, because here is a woman who all these years had prayed that God would give her a child. It was her heart's desire. But within that desire and within that prayer, she said, Lord, if you give him to me, I'll do what? I'll give him back to you. And this is really where I want to just kind of bring it back to a moment because we think about the question that Jesus, or the statement that Jesus made. Give unto God the things that are God's. I can tell you this in my life and, my t- and what I will say, and I don't want to, but I want to challenge all of us to think about it in our own lives. What do we sometimes mistakenly take to be ours that really belongs to God? What is it that we are holding on to that we need to simply say, Lord, I want to give it back to you. It belongs to you. You know, we'll fuss and we'll fret every time it comes around April 15th or whatever it is now. Man, I think at this point, you you can postpone it for a while at least. but, But come around April, we fuss and we fret, but we do what? We give what is supposed to be given. Why? Because we know that it's the right thing to do. But why do we fuss and fret so much when God says, I want your time. I want your talent. I want your treasure. I want your family. You know, I should never be so uh, selfish to think, Lord, you've given me these kids and and, and now I I want them to do what they want. No, I want to make sure that my kids know, hey, there's nothing better than serving the Lord. There's nothing better than than being a part of a a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church where we come to not only hear the Word of God, but where we get equipped to go out and serve Him and to love people and to love the community and share the gospel. And you know why? Because everything that He's given to us, we ought to be willing to say, Lord, in the abundance of my heart and in gratitude and thankfulness for what You've given to me, I want to give it back to You. I want to give of my time. I want to give of my strength. I want to give of the, uh, of the ability that you've given me and, and not be stingy about it. People take all the time to try to cheat their way out of pain and, and defrauding and, 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 and getting more back than, than what they should from the government. But Christian, why should we be the same when it comes to the Lord? Why should we be so uh, trying all the time to think, well, you know, uh, not this week, uh, maybe not today, Uh, I'm not feeling up to it tonight, or I'm not coming uh, for this or for that. And listen, you know, between you and the Lord, you have to decide what you and your family are going to do. But I want to encourage you with this. Give back to God what he has given to you. Don't look at it as, I have to do this. Look at it as, I'm just simply giving back to God what he's given to me. I know we took a lot of time to read scripture and kind of build the foundation. The challenge is very, very short and to the point. The question or the statement that Jesus made, I want to turn into a question. You know what belongs to God. Are you going to give it back to him? You know what belongs to Caesar, right? Every paycheck, you find out, again, what belongs to him. And every quarter, come property tax time, you find out how much belongs to him, right? But the question is this, do you know what belongs to God? Your family, your time, your treasure, Who's given you all these great blessings? I want to challenge you with this. Let's give it back to God. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the life that you've given us. The talents, the abilities. Maybe not always in our bodies a full measure of health or physical strength, but Lord, what you have given us 
and what you have given us in family and talents and abilities, what you've given us in family and, and children, it all belongs to you. Lord, help us not to be stingy. Help us to give back what you have given. Like Hannah who said, Lord, if you would just give me a child, I would give him back to you. Lord, may that always be our desire and our mindset that we would give back to you the things that belong to you. Lord, we pray again for our pastor that you would help him to uh, rest and recover and, and uh, his body will heal and that you'll relieve him of any pain that he might be feeling. And Lord, for all those that were mentioned uh, tonight, we pray for them uh, that you would continue to just in the lives of people here and the burdens that they have, may you heal sickness, meet needs, and deliver from evil, Lord, and bring spiritual healing. Lord, we pray that you'll, again, bless our church. We pray that you'll bless uh, the remainder of our time here together, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you.